Biblical numerology, which just means numbers in the Bible, is a fascinating study for a lot of people. For instance, a lot of folks have said that the number one in the Bible stands for unity. On the other hand, number two stands for division. And on and on it goes, and, and folks have figured out something that just about every number stands for, at least 12, and sometimes even further than that. But just about everybody who, who is into biblical numerology will tell you that the number seven stands for completion or for perfection. Now let me just give you a few examples about how that plays out in the Bible. God made a week for seven days. Seven pairs of animals, clean animals, went to the ark. Israel marched around the city of Jericho seven times uh, uh, for seven days, and the seventh day they marched around it seven times. There will be seven years of tribulation before Jesus comes again, perfect wrath being poured out on the world of sin. And in that tribulation, there are seven seal judgments, seven trumpet judgments, and seven bowl judgments. And it goes on and on. But today we're going to look at the number seven as it pertains to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in the book of John, John tells us very specifically why he wrote that book. And so just listen to what he said. John chapter 20, but listen. Here's what John wrote. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. John wrote the Gospel of John for the explicit purpose of bringing people to faith in Christ. And he builds his argument for this faith on, on two distinct principles. One, he takes seven miracles of Jesus and builds that argument that Jesus was the Son of God. Now there is an eighth miracle in John 21, but he's already through his argument really with those seven miracles. Also in John, he does something that no other gospel writer does. Matthew, Mark, nor Luke. And that is, he gives the seven great I am statements of Jesus. For instance, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Seven <laughs> statements that nobody ever makes except John. And you see, these seven miracles and these seven statements that Jesus made fit perfectly with this purpose of the number seven being the number of completeness or perfection. It tells us that Jesus truly is the complete, perfect Son of God, Savior of the world, Savior from death, sin, hell, and the grave, Savior from everything else that, 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 that would plague us. Charles Spurgeon, my great old uh, Baptist preacher of the 19th century, said this, More of Jesus, more of Jesus, this is the sovereign cure for all our faults. I want to tell you, friends, for every problem in this world, regardless of its nature, the ultimate answer is Jesus. Now, some people would say, well, preacher, that is just too simplistic. It can't be that easy. Well, let me tell you, if you think that's too simplistic, then I would just invite you to go uh, read the book of Isaiah. You see, Isaiah... Isaiah writes in many passages about the millennial reign of Christ. When Christ comes back, sets up his throne, reigns for a thousand years. And listen, when he does that, you read it in Isaiah. It is a utopia of peace, health, and joy. Yes, it is simple, but it's true. All our maladies of life are, are solved by Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, this utopia that I've been talking about that Isaiah writes about is a, it, it, it's a mega distance from the world we live in today, though, isn't it? We live in a world that's drowning in sin and sorrow. And I promise you, there's somebody in here today who would say, well, Brother Mike, that's me. You see, you're, you're, you're drowning also in sin and sorrow. And you see, I'll tell you, uh, if you are, if that is you, there's only one hope for you, and that's Jesus. Jesus Christ is the only hope. And for the next couple of months, we're going to be talking about that. We're going to take a look at these seven I am statements. 
Seven things Jesus said, I am. And we're going to see he is so sufficient to be every need in all these great statements about who he is. Now, the first one that Jesus said was, I am the bread of life. Let's take a look at what he says about that and just see how that plays out in our lives. Would you get your Bible, please, and turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We're going to read about what he says about himself there. I'm going to be reading verse 22. So you follow along while I read. John chapter 6, beginning in verse 22. On the following day, when the people were standing on the other side of the sea, and they saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with the disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they ate after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got in the boat and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then, that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Now look at verse 51, if you will. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The setting of this discourse between Jesus and a group of the Jews was the day after he had fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. After he had eaten, Jesus sent them away, sent the crowd away. He sent the disciples down into a boat to cross over to the Sea of Galilee. And he went up into a mountain to pray. And if you read the text there earlier, you see that the, the, the wind got to blow and the, and, and the waves got to getting high on the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus walked on the water to the disciples in the boat. He calmed the sea and they made it safely to the other side. The next day, the multitude came back to where they got fed and they re realized Jesus wasn't there. So they got into some boats themselves and crossed over the sea looking for Jesus. And when they found him, Jesus said in essence to them, what are y'all doing here? Look at verse 26 and just see what he said specifically. He said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Jesus said, you're not seeking me for some spiritual reason. You don't get closer to God. You just want your bellies to get filled again, just like yesterday. And when he said that, he exposed to them, he exposed their hearts for what they really were. That is, they had hard hearts. They were hardened in their hearts. You see, when, when Jesus fed them those, with those five loaves and two fishes, verse 26 says he gave an unmistakable sign that he was the Messiah, the one they said they'd been looking for for all these years. Look, if you will, in verse 30 and 31 again. Look what it says. They said to Jesus, What sign will you perform that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. 
They, they said, Jesus, what kind of sign are you going to do to prove to us you're the Messiah? Well, listen, what do you think it would have took? He had already fed 5,000 of them with just five loaves and two fish. What, what, what do you think they were saying? Well, look, if five, do 50. If you do 50, we'll believe. What were they looking for? Well, let me tell you, they really weren't looking for a sign at all. You see, they didn't really want to have to deal with Jesus because they didn't want him to be their Messiah. They were expecting some king, not some lowly comforter from Nazareth. He didn't fit the picture. They didn't want another sign of the Messiah. They wanted another food sign. They wanted another healing sign. They just wanted another blessing. That's all they wanted. By the way, may I say, that's the way a lot of people come to Jesus today. They don't want to follow him as Lord. They don't want to serve him. They just wanted to do something for him. I hope that's not the way you feel about Jesus. That's not the way we ought to be, friends. He is our Lord, not our lackey. Well, in verse 27, Jesus graciously, he doesn't give them another sign. He doesn't give them another meal. He gave them something a whole lot better. He gave them something they needed to hear. He gave them the best advice they could have ever heard. Look what he said in verse 27. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life. He said, look, don't worry about material stuff. And by the way, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't talking here about having earned his salvation when he said labor for the food that gives eternal life. We know better than that. He wasn't talking about earning his salvation. In fact, in that same verse, he talks about just giving salvation. It's a free gift. What he was saying was this. He was saying, don't put your focus on things in this world, on food that perishes, that spoils, or anything in this world, because it's all going to spoil and go away. Put your focus on eternal things. That was what Jesus was trying to tell them. It's the same thing that he said in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, Lay down yourselves treasures on earth where moth and, and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up yourselves treasures in heaven. That's the idea. Focus on heavenly things. Now, friends, let me say to you, everybody in this room has a focus. You've got a focus. And if it's not Jesus, it is one of the five R's of the devil. Five R's. Let me share with you very quickly. One of the R's of the devil is riches. The Bible says, but the love of money is the root of all evil. If your focus is rich, it's friends, you're in trouble. I talked to a young person not all that long ago who was in school, and some person told me that all they wanted to do was get out of school <coughs> and make money. And I told them, I said, you know, uh, <coughs> you're living, but money is not the solution to your problems or your desire for happiness. I'm not sure if they took that advice or not. But riches is one R of the devil. Another is romance. Some people think, man, if I, some single people, if I just get married, man, I'll be all smiles. If I just get my marriage to be what it ought to be, I'll be all smiles. Listen, if, if, if that's not it, I mean, if you're single, the Bible does say if you can find a wife, finds a good thing. Hope you can't get married one day if it's God's will. Hope you get your marriage straight. That is not straight. That, but that is not the that is not the end of everything. You used to be miserable if all you've done is have a little romance in your life. Another art of the devil is recognition. Some people have just a deep need to be recognized and needed by others, and they will do anything. They'll they'll run for any office. They'll volunteer for any job just to see if their their name is in the paper or their picture on Facebook. And let me tell you. Some of them don't wait for somebody else to post their picture. They got so many 70s on Facebook, they got the one in Carter's got them to deliver people. Uh, and I hope that's not you. But, re but recognition. Well, what's another art of the day? Well, what about recreation? You know? Um, some people work hard at their play, whatever it is. Now, sometimes this recreation is physical. <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's, it's really not physical. It, it, it's on devices. And, and, and people just get their recreation. You know what I read this week? Somebody did some, some kind of survey. I'm sure it's not true of our teenagers. But the average teen in America 
spends about 2,500 hours per year on a device. Look, I did the math. That's 48 hours a week, 52 weeks. That's a pretty hard job. That really is. Working hard at recreation. But you see, we really can't point our fingers at the teenagers if we're adults. Because according to some other surveys, adults are just, just about as bad on television. About six hours a day. Recreation. Tool of the devil. The last R might fool you. You know what that is? Religion. Now, now, the Pharisees had their focus on religion. They were doing all they could and looking good and keeping the Old Testament law, but inside Jesus said, you're a bunch of, you're, you're, you're full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Friends, let me tell you something. These five R's, if they're your focus, will send you to eternal hell if you're not careful. Now, let me say, sin, uh, th th this religion R is sinful every time. Every time in this world. Because you see, religion, pure religion, is nothing more than just a checklist faith. If I do this, if I do this, if I do this, I'm sure God's going to love me, and I'm still going to have my name on the roll book in heaven. Not so. You can check every little box you got if you want to, but you will still perish eternally if Jesus Christ is not your Lord and your Savior. Listen, your salvation is not what, all, not what you check you've done. It's what Jesus has already done. And that's what he did when he did when he shed his blood on the cross for your sins. And so, friends, listen, religion is, is sinful every time. Recognition is sinful a lot of time. If it's just for yourself, John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. Paul said, God forbid that I should glory, saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Over the Lord's crucified of men, out of the world. Our lives are not to bring glory to us. Our lives are to bring glory to Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And may I say, when your life does bring that glory to Jesus, you have more joy and more peace than you'll ever have in the other world. Well, what about riches? Let me tell you, as I said, riches can be our downfall. Uh, Paul says the love of money is, is the root of all evil. But, but I, I do want to make something clear. God does not condemn riches per se. In fact, God made Solomon, his king, the richest man in all the world. So riches in themselves are not wrong. God never said don't make a living. He never said don't make a good living. Listen, if you make a good living, if, if, if you're rich in the eyes of the world, you just don't say thank God for my, for, my, for my blessings that you give me. Just don't make it your focus. It cannot be your focus. Recreation's okay. Jesus said himself, come ye apart and let's rest a while. He told the disciples that. Listen, so there's nothing wrong with recreation. Now listen, if, if, if you do find a wife, you get some romance, that's a good thing if God designs that. So you see, all these things are okay except for religion. They just cannot be our focus. If they are focused, listen, we are sorry. Young people, school can't be your focus. When you think about it, school, if you're in school, that is your job. Your job is to do your best, make good grades, get out of school, and then get a job. Or go to college or trade school, and then get a job. But it cannot be your focus. Nothing can be our focus but Jesus. If life is going to play out and life's going to bless us, it's got to be Christ. Now let me tell you why. Why is this? Don't miss this. You see, all the things I've been talking about, the five R's the devil will lay on you, school if you're young, it all, all has to do with this life. But we are not finite beings. We are infinite beings in that we have an eternal soul. We will live forever and anything we try to satisfy our eternal beings with that pertains to this life just won't work. It is, it is earthly food that will perish. It cannot satisfy our eternal hunger. What will happen is this. You try to satisfy your eternal hunger with food that perishes, things of this world, you're going to wind up like they said Marie Antoinette did. The woman must have been sick or something. But that queen of friends at one point said, nothing tastes. Nothing tastes good to her. Let me tell you. Everything.
sin will lose its taste eventually in this world. If you're trying to use it to satisfy the hunger of your soul, it just won't do it. Listen, that's why some men will walk away and divorce some of the most beautiful women in the world because beauty didn't satisfy the hunger of their soul. That's why some millionaires commit suicide because money did not do it. That's why Tom Brady made the statement he made. Everybody knows who Tom Brady is. If you don't, he is the only quarterback in NFL history who won five Super Bowls. When he won his third Super Bowl, he kind of did a little reflecting on life. Here's what Tom Brady said after winning ring number three. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey man, this is what it is. I reached my goal, my dream, my life. Me, I think, God, got to be more true than this. I mean, this isn't, this can't be what it's all cranked up to be. When he said that, in the interviewer, Steve Croft, asked him, he said, well, Tom, what's the answer? Here's what Tom Brady said. I wish I knew. I wish I knew. I love playing football. I love being a quarterback for this team. But at the same time, I think there are a lot of other parts of me I'm trying to find out. And what an honest confession of the emptiness of his soul. Because he didn't know the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And nothing satisfied this world had to offer. The bottom line is, friend, nothing in this world will taste, fulfill the, 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 the emptiness in your heart and satisfy the desire you have for spiritual food. Only God can give that to you. Now that's what Jesus was telling these Jews in verses 32 and 33. I want to read it again. Look what he said, verse 32. He tells the Jews, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives his life to the world. Now these Jews he's talking to were stuck on R number five, religion. They were stuck on keeping the law. And they were appealing to the manna that God sent from heaven as to their reasoning for continuing to obey the Mosaic law. And they're saying the law is where it's at. And Jesus said, that's not it. God didn't give you this manna. That's not, the manna was not the true bread. The true bread is the bread of God who gives life to the world. And of course, Jesus was talking about itself. Here's what the manna, this is the manna was simply a picture of what Jesus is. The manna fed those Israelites for 40 years. It was white. It was red. It was perfect nourishment for their bodies. It was a picture of Jesus' perfect nourishment for our souls. And he is the only one that can give us that. Now, when you look at verse 34, it seems like these Jews are about to get it. They're about to get what Jesus is talking about. It seems like they're about to think they've got that aha moment. You know what? Maybe, we, maybe I am missing something. Maybe Jesus can satisfy my hunger. And so they asked him in verse 34. Look what they say in verse 34. They say, Lord, give us this bread always. Now we're going to find out in a few minutes. They weren't really serious about that. But I will say this. If you are serious, if you're serious about knowing God, that's a great example to follow. That's a great example. Lord, give me this bread. Give me this living bread. And God, just don't give me one help. Just don't give me a second help. Lord, give me this bread always, all the time. <clears throat> the psalmist said in Psalm 34, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Anybody ever taste and see that the Lord is good? Yeah. Get a witness. Some of you have. Yeah. You know he's good. And friend, listen, when you find out the Lord is good, you think that's the last taste you want? Heavens no, you don't you, you, you're gonna want some more. You're gonna want some more. You see, Jesus, when you find him, you find he is good. He is no more than he is excellent. Listen, he is soul food at its best, and you're gonna want some more. I like to eat sweets. Just like them uh, to a fault. 
Somebody say amen, please. Amen. 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 <laughs> and I'm telling you, uh, we got a church full of folks that, that can cook some desserts. And I just tell you, you really can. And, 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 my, and nobody's better than my precious dear wife, Jen. She can put them out. Uh, but I'll tell you, ladies, no offense. But there is a man that can cook desserts better than most women. His name is Mr. Edwards. <laughs> and if anybody has had a Mr. Edwards, uh, one of those uh, pie, turtle, turtle, turtle pies. Oh man, that's my list. I could eat a whole turtle pie every day. I could. Uh, you see, once you get a taste of a good dessert, you just don't want some more. You don't want some more. You're not going to, you're just not going to stop with one piece of pie. You're going to eat a second, a third, you know. You just eat the whole thing you can. Uh, some of y'all are old enough to remember, to remember uh, when uh, Jack's hamburger stands started popping up back in the early 60s. <clears throat> so this is going to predate uh, some of y'all. But some of us old timers remember. I dare not sing it with this voice, but uh, Zach's hamburger for 15 cents. Or so far, good, good, good. You'll go back, back, back. Go ahead, Jacks, Jacks, Jacks. For more, more, more. You see, that's what you do. Listen, when you when you get a taste of Jesus, that's what you can't just walk away. You gotta go back, back, back for more, more, more. That is the satisfaction of Jesus. It's a paradox. When you get to, when you come to know Christ, you arrive. You don't want anything else. You just want more of what's already done. That was the, listen, that was the way it was with the saints in the Old Testament. Moses, listen, nobody was closer to God than Moses. Moses saw God in the burning bush. God spoke to him audibly from a burning bush. Moses went up on the mountain and he spent 40 days with God, hearing God and seeing God giving the Ten Commandments. It tells us that Moses went into the tabernacle of meeting among the children of Israel. And in that tabernacle of meeting, he saw God face to face. How close can you get? How close can you get in that? But here's what it says in Exodus 33. After all this, Moses cries out to God in Exodus 33. Lord, show me your glory. Couldn't get enough of God. David couldn't get enough of God. David said in Psalm, in Psalm 42, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul thirsted for thee, O God. Paul couldn't get enough of God. Paul tells us at one point in his life, God elevated him up into the third heaven. And Paul, he was such a mission to Paul, he said, I don't even know if I was in the body or out of the body. I just know I went to heaven. Third heaven, top heaven, where God's way up. He said it was so mysterious, I can't even write about it. We don't even know what he saw or, or, what, he, or what was said to him. It was so mysterious. We never know. But you know what Paul went, went on to pray? He wrote to the Philippian church. After that, he said, oh God, I want to know you and the power of your resurrection. My goodness, does he not know him already? He just couldn't get enough. He couldn't get enough of Jesus. And that's the way it's been with the saints ever since. Old St. Augustine lived two or three hundred years after Paul, wrote this. To fall in love with God is the greatest romance. To seek Him is the greatest adventure. To find Him is the greatest human achievement. That's true. Because I don't care how much you succeed in this life. You don't find God, you've missed it all. It's the greatest human achievement to find God. The hymn writer, William Williams, who only wrote this a couple of hundred years ago, wrote a hymn, you've probably sung, some of you, guide me, O oh, thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with that powerful man. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I walk no more. Feed me till I walk no more. He had that hunger in his heart. Oh, bread of heaven, feed me, feed me. Well, it seemed like this was the place these Jews had come to. When they asked God to give them his bread always. <coughs> That's where Jesus had brought them to. They asked him the question. 
But um, they bailed out. We'll see that in a minute. But here's what Jesus said. He said, I am the bread you're looking for. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth in me shall never thirst. And the Greek language is literal, literally says, I am I alone am the bread of life. Nowhere else can you find what you're looking for except through me. I alone am the bread of life. Here's what he was saying. Listen, here we, he was, let me paraphrase this. Jesus said, everything you're longing for, everything in this world, love, joy, peace, security, wisdom and power to deal with all the struggles of your life, everything you're looking for in this world is found in me and me alone. And when this life is over, I am your only guarantee you're going to make it to heaven. There's no other guarantee. Look at verse 51. Look what he says. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Well, the Jews bailed out. They said, we just can't take all this. Look at verse 60. What they said. When his brothers, sorry. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. They wanted the food. And one of the healings, they just didn't want to make him walk and follow him. Well, I've got two questions for you to kind of wind this message down. First of all, Jesus says, I and I alone am the bread of life. That's quite a statement to make. You can't find peace in your soul in any other place than through me. That's pretty arrogant. Some people say, and that's the reason they reject Christ. How can he say such an arrogant thing to he alone? That's what he says. So what gives him the right to make such a statement? I'll tell you. Because Paul writes, in Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. What does that mean? That means God in all his fullness dwells in Jesus. He is almighty God in the flesh. Now listen, when God dwells in you, what more do you need, may I ask? Nothing. You've got the king of the universe <coughs> who can supply every need dwelling inside of you. That's the reason he has the right to make such a claim. Second question. What about you? What about you? You have a hunger in your heart who will never satisfy any other place except through Jesus Christ. And some of you may have been trying and trying and trying to satisfy that deep hunger in, in a million different places, just like we've talked about already. And you have come up, but we have just a dead end wall. <coughs> what about you today? Jesus said, Come unto me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. I promise you, there's some folks in here today who need some rest. And Jesus says, I'll give it to you. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And you hear my voice and open the door. I will come in. Because you can to you with me. Does Jesus need to come into your life today? I promise you, he's here to do it. In that same passage, Jesus said, All the Father give me shall come to me. When you come to me, I will in no wise cast out. If you come to Christ today, you can be sure he will never turn you away. Let me say, there's some of you who make that commitment in here, most likely. There's some others of us who are believers. And quite honestly, um, we've lost our focus. You may be here, you've lost your focus. You're born again, and you know you're born again. But you know you're miserable. Amen, you're miserable because you know what? Your focus is not on Jesus anymore. You're still trying to satisfy that hunger of your heart, but you can't satisfy him in the place of Jesus. And you're miserable as a believer. And you'll always be miserable if you come back and make Jesus your focus once more. And I pray that he'll do it. I pray that he'll do it. That's your There's others here 
that God's calling me to make another commitment of some other nature. Maybe you just need to repent of your sin and get right with God because of sin in your life. Maybe God has called some to, to stake their lives in this body and, 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 and serve God here. But there's a calling in your mind to focus on, to, to focus on, so that Jesus be Lord. You know what it is, and I just pray you're open as God speaks to you. Would you please?